Hello, Tolkien geeks. Voice of Geekdom is making a comeback over the festive season, and I'm ready and excited to bring you more new Tolkien content. Thank you for all of your kind comments while I have been taking time off from the channel, and for those who have been here from the start and have showed concern. Please remember to hit the old like button, and subscribe and hit the bell icon button if you are new. I'm pleased to say that we'll be getting right back into the next chapter of The Silmarillion next week, when we find out what has been going on in Beleriand for the last several thousand years, while the drama of Melkor, Feanor and the Silmarils was playing out in Amman. Today I am paying a few of you back for your patience by responding to selected comments from the Silmarillion series so far, and in the process recapping the storyline ahead of the continuation. There were a lot of really good comments to choose from, and so I've decided to split my responses into two videos. With that out of the way, let's get into the season recap. My very first video, which I hope you will still remember, was on the Ainur Lindele, the music of the Ainur. This was the origin story of the cosmos in Tolkien's secondary world, the great cosmogonical creation myth of the universe of Ea. This first video in the Silmarillion Explained series has attracted quite a few comments, and a lot of them were simply full of praise from those of you that had just discovered this series. But I've decided to pick out this one from Connie SMS, who simply says, I am currently reading the Silmarillion, and this playlist slash channel is a godsend. Thank you for taking the time to make these videos, they are very helpful. What Connie so kindly praised me for here is exactly what this series was supposed to be about. Breaking down the story to make it more manageable for first or second time readers. I am proud that multiple viewers have messaged me to tell me that they have purchased the book on the back of discovering my coverage of it. Some of you have said that you are watching this series without reading from the book directly, which is also fine, but I wish I could do more to encourage everyone to pick up a copy of The Silmarillion. The next video was on the Valar Quenta, the breakdown of the Valar and the Maiar, and of Morgoth and his many deadly servants. This first stretch of the story which we have covered so far is what I think of as the Valinorian stretch of the Quenta. Although the Valar, and one of them in particular, will continue to have an impact on the story, we won't really be going back to Valinor itself until the very final chapter. This history which we are getting is from the Elves' perspective. Remember that within its fictional frame, the content that we are getting in The Silmarillion was compiled and translated by Bilbo in the Third Age, presumably from whatever written records existed in Rivendell during his tenure there, and perhaps also supplemented with Elrond and Glorfindel's eyewitness testimonies. On that, we can only speculate. We next moved on with Chapter 1 of The Beginning of Days, which covers a period of many thousands of years at the beginning of time. Seven Seraphim Seven had this to say. And even this soon, we see one of the greatest themes in Tolkien's work that you so aptly described by comparing Melkor to things like plate tectonics creating mountains. Evil and destruction will ultimately only serve the side of good. It may try to mar that which is pure and beautiful, but will ultimately only show new facets of its beauty none had yet thought of. I agree with this very strongly, and this great comment deliberately echoes and paraphrases Eru's words from the Ainulindale. There is challenge and conflict in the world. But along with that marring, there are great deeds which are measured against evil. Heroism, which could not exist without that innate conflict. But I think also here there is a sense of the gradual diminishment of the world. A slow decline which takes many centuries. Tolkien makes loss beautiful. 
He describes the fading of beauty from the world by focusing on its timelessness and on the slow sorrow which follows. Tolkien's is a very medievalist perspective and it plays a very big part in creating the mythic feel of his world. Next, we covered Aule the Maker's sub-creation of the Dwarven race and his wife Yavanna's response. Yavanna, who was wonderfully portrayed by my frequent collaborator, the Clueless Fangirl. Reflective Rambling made this comment. One thing I loved about Aule is that while he's gruff and probably should have had better communication skills with his wife, like you pointed out, it's first pointed out that he has a sense that Melkor doesn't. He's motivated by protecting these creatures and developing them to thrive, not be tools. I took this part, and the pairing of Yavanna and Aule itself as the hope between industry and nature. It doesn't deny the destructive nature of people and technology, but it suggests that there might be some sort of balance or cycle established. It hit me while watching this that there is much to do about the tension between dwarves and Ents. But while the dwarves remember Aule well, I never picked up on as much generational tension between the Ents and the dwarves. Aule and Yavanna are both what we call sub-creators, yes. And indeed there is certainly a sort of duality in their partnership. You will have noticed by now that there are thematic links implicit in many of the familial connections between members of the Valar. The Feyenturi, the brothers Mandos and Lorien, and their sister Nienna, are another excellent example. This is to be expected, maybe, in beings which personify characteristics of the mind of the creator. That the Valar seem to fit so well together like this shouldn't surprise us. The argument which Aule makes to Iluvatar that his desire to create is a product of his own father's creative nature, and thus both innate and inevitable, is key to this chapter because it shows where Aule's humility is as a sub-creator. Humility before the creator, and not in his rivalry. As for the dwarves and the Ents, remember that in The Lord of the Rings, when Legolas asks Treebeard whether Gimli is free to travel with him in Fangorn Forest after the end of the war, Treebeard is initially reluctant to trust a dwarf and an axe bearer, until Legolas tells him that Gimli's axe is meant only for orc necks. There is enmity there, even if it is soon withdrawn. The Ents and the Dwarves are going to come up against one another again later on in the Quenta Silmarillion though, towards the end of Beren's part in the book, so it will take us some time to get there. Stay tuned in. The next chapter is on the awakening of the Elves, the latter half of which includes a depiction on one of Tolkien's possible origin stories for the Orcs that they were elves originally and were taken by the Dark Powers, Melkor in this case, and tortured and mutilated, exactly as Christopher Lee says in the movie. Ridiculous Ed Tollett asked this follow-up question on the Orcs. One of my biggest questions is, where do Orcs go when they die? We know about elves and a bit about men, We've even got two theories to ponder when it comes to dwarves. But what about orcs? Do they just end up in the void? The answer to this is that we just don't know. And the reason that we don't know seems to be because Tolkien himself didn't know. The nature of the orcs is a topic which I might want to write a whole video on at some point actually, but basically Tolkien had difficulty with reconciling the treatment of the orcs that we see in The Lord of the Rings. Merciless treatment at the hands of our heroes, that is, which would seem to indicate that orcs should be treated as irredeemably evil, with the Silmarillion material. There is a whole section towards the end of Morgoth's Ring which gives a number of alternative backstories for the orcs, as Tolkien was trying to work through pretty much this exact problem. Christopher Tolkien eventually decides to go back to a slightly earlier version with his editorial choice in the published Silmarillion. 
which offers us only slightly unsatisfactory data with which to hypothesize on the orcs, and whether they are given feia. That's the Quenya word for, essentially, in this context, a spirit. So that's about the only answer I can give, but Tolkien's musings on this subject are really interesting, and worthy of a future video topic, so thanks for the question. Next, we covered the meeting of Melian and Thingol, the future king and queen of the Sindar Elves. The Maiar and the king of the Teleri Elves meet by chance, if chance you call it, in the forest of Nan Elmoth, and as they do so are frozen in time while the world moves on around them, locked in a fairy trance. The power of their love and their doom holds them in place. Given the pivotal role of their later child in our story, and the long line of important descendants that followed, it is hard not to think that this chapter represented a very deliberate part of Iluvatar's divine plan. Jacob Albers commented on Melian and Thingol, I can't imagine how it felt to fall in love that hard with someone. Let's hope that you never have to, Jacob. The next chapter picks up on the story of the migration of the elves again. Olmo ferries most of the three tribes across the ocean, aboard the island which will later come to rest just off the shores of Amman, Tol Erisea. We go back again to Reflective Rambling, who had this to say. I don't know if my brain is that leaky, or the audiobook I had listened to was abridged at a random spot, because I honestly had no recollection of the creation of an island. And on an equally foolish note, I still wonder what possessed Tolkien to name something so important, Tuna. But I was swept away with the description of Alquilonde. It sounds quite like heaven, honestly. I thought about making some kind of tuna fish joke in my script for this video, but the Prancing Pony guys, Alan and Sean, in their podcast breakdown of the Silmarillion, already refer to Tyrion upon Tuna, that's the city of Tyrion upon the hill of Tuna, as Tuna upon Rye every time they come across that phrase in the text. There is no way that I could come up with anything better than that. So that's it for this first part of my recap Q&A. I'll follow up again with part two of this just as soon as I can, but look out for the full breakdown of chapter 10 coming next week.